Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to finish out the week and do a preview of the upcoming May 14th primary. And we've got three states with action. We've got Maryland, Nebraska, and West Virginia. The goal is to do another stream that day, so check it out if you're interested. For this video, there is going to be a lot of action and a lot of data, so I am going to try to go really quick so I can get it all in. So first, we'll start with Maryland, and we've got Ballotpedia pulled up. This will show you all the offices that are having elections this year. So I'm not going to cover everything, but we're going to start with the major race. That's the U.S. Senate. And if you've been following that race, you know that this is an open seat. Ben Cardin is not running for re-election. It's an extremely blue state, so the focus is going to be on the Democratic primary. And it's come down to two main candidates, Angela Alsobrooks and David Trone. Alsobrooks is the Prince George's County Executive. She's considered more progressive, and you could take a look at her many endorsements here. David Trone is a U.S. representative. Apparently, he's going to be considered more moderate, and he has less endorsements, but you could also take a look at those here. I'm going to keep it moving, but there's been a lot of debates and forums. We've got their fundraising here. David Trone has raised a lot more. He is able to sell fund because he's a businessman in the wine business. But how does that translate into the polling? Well, Trone has been leading all of them up until the Emerson poll that just dropped. Now it looks like it's neck and neck. Who knows which way the late breakers are going to go. So that's going to be a big race to take a look at. On the Republican side, former Republican Governor Larry Hogan entered the race at the last minute. He was very popular during his time in office, even though a lot of the Trump base would consider him to be too moderate or a rhino. But without Hogan, there's no point in taking a look at this race for the general election. But can Hogan even get to the general election? I always thought he would get it easily, even though there's technically a bit of a crowded primary. If we go past the debates and down to the polling, there Hogan has a significant lead over perennial candidate Robin Ficker. Now, the general election is kind of a different video, but real quick, Hogan did have significant leads a few months ago. I did expect that to flip at some point, but apparently it already moved 20 points against Hogan. Now he's trailing by around 10 points. So we'll give that race some time to develop post-primary. Now we can also move on to the U.S. House, and there are eight districts Republicans control one of them. The other ones are going to be safe blue with one exception, but the other thing to mention is pretty much all of these districts on both sides do have some sort of primary challengers. So the main ones to watch are going to be the second and the third district. Those are going to be blue, so the Democrats are going to be the focus. It is interesting in the second district to see Kim Klasik running for the GOP. You might remember her run from back in 2020, and there really are a ton of Democrats running in a lot of these districts. There's way too many to follow, so we'll just have to see what happens on election day. The only other race that could potentially be competitive is the 6th district. Now, that's the district that David Trone currently occupies. So since he's running for the Senate, it's going to be open. Given he won by almost 10 last time in the general election, it would seem unlikely that the Republicans are going to be able to seriously compete for this seat. Again, Democrats have a ton of candidates running. On the Republican side, they also have a ton. The notable names here are Dan Cox, who was the GOP nominee for governor in 2022. He was considered too controversial, not a great fit for this blue state. So he's going to be facing off against Neil Parrott, who was the nominee back in 2020 as well as 22. So this is a race to take a look at. So there is a lot here going on in the old Lion state, but we've got to keep it moving. We're going to go on to Nebraska. Again, here are the 2024 races on Ballotpedia. There's a ton of information here, and as always, all the links will be down below in the description. But let's get on to the main races. There's no governor's race in Nebraska this year, but we've got two U.S. Senate elections. First, let's start with the special election. This is to finish the remainder of Ben Sass's term, who stepped down early. Current Governor Jim Pillen appointed former Governor Pete Ricketts to the seat when he took office. It does look like there's some token opposition to Ricketts, but it seems like Ricketts is easily going to be the nominee. If we go down to the Democrats, they've got Preston Love Jr. It looks like he's running unopposed. In the general election, I don't think it matters much. Ricketts should be able to win the seat comfortably. Now, the other Senate election is the regular one, and that has incumbent Republican Deb Fisher running for re-election. Now, last time she won by about 19 points, so in theory, it should not be competitive. She only has token opposition in the primary, but what about the other side? Can Democrats compete in this red state? Well, there are actually no Democrats that decided to run. Instead, there is an independent candidate in Dan Osborne. It looks like he might get the support of the Democrats behind him, so he might be facing off as an independent in the general election against Fisher, the Republican. So that could make the race a little bit more interesting. It should make it more competitive than a 19-point win for Fisher. Now, again, this is mostly about the primary and not about the general election, but let's take a second and see what the polling shows. Well, all the way back in November, there was a change research poll that showed Dan Osborne in the lead by two points. Now, Osborne was behind that poll, and it's from a long time ago, so you've got to take it with a real grain of salt. But we do have a recent one from PPP, and again, this was commissioned by Osborne himself, but Fisher is ahead only by four points, 37 to 33, a massive 30% undecided. Now, I can understand an independent 
independent candidate having appeal with voters in a deeply red or blue state. However, that's mostly prior to the election. As election day gets closer and campaigns get fleshed out, usually we see the partisan lean of the state prevail. The easiest example I can compare that to is back in 2014 in Kansas. They had a U.S. Senate race with Pat Roberts, the incumbent Republican. And in the general election, it actually was between Pat Roberts and Greg Orman, an independent candidate. If you go down and take a look at the polling, the more recent ones are at the bottom, and it looked like it was back and forth. Greg Orman was leading a lot of these polls, even getting in the high 40s in many of them. So it looked like there could be a chance here for the independent candidate over the Republican in the fairly red state of Kansas. But what actually happened? Well, Pat Roberts, the incumbent, he won by over 10 points. But there is an allure with independent candidates prior to the election. Many, many times, though, that does drop off in the end. Now let's move on to the U.S. House in Nebraska. There's three congressional districts and there's not much action happening. The most competitive is going to be in the second congressional district. That's the Don Bacon district and he's a more moderate candidate as this district does cover Omaha and does have a fairly balanced partisan lead. So Bacon is going to face a challenge from his right. In the couple of polls here, it looks like he's going to cruise to victory. The other side, we've got Tony Vargas and that's going to be a rematch in the general election. Last time, Bacon won by two and a half. The other district's very red, not much to take a look at. Finally, we've got West Virginia. Again, here's the Ballotpedia page that shows the offices up for election in 2024. Let's go on to the most notable races. We've got the U.S. Senate, and this is the Joe Manchin seat who is not running for re-election. So the focus is going to be on the Republican side, but if we go down a little bit, we can see for the Democrats, they've got Don Blankenship running, and if his name sounds familiar, he used to be a Republican as well as part of the Constitution Party. He's made some previous runs at elected office, and apparently he is actually running for this U.S. Senate seat. However, the other two candidates, Glenn Elliott and Zach Shrewsbury, they're the ones that actually have endorsements here on Wikipedia. Now, on the Republican side, we've got a two-way battle. Jim Justice, the current Republican governor, is the front runner. He did used to be a Democrat. He's a very wealthy guy. He's got the Donald Trump endorsement. He is going to face off against Alex Mooney, who is currently in the U.S. House. Mooney does have his share of endorsements, but if we go past the fundraising and down to the polling, Jim Justice has a clear lead. He's up about two to one over Mooney, so it looks very likely that Jim Justice is going to win this primary and then go on to win the general election. That would be a flip and a pickup for the GOP. Now, the bigger race might actually be for governor. This is an open seat because Jim Justice is term limited and he's running for the Senate. So the Republicans have a crowded field here. And we've got three or four notable candidates here. We've got more Capito. He does seem to be a little bit more of a moderate candidate. And he's the son of current U.S. Senator there, Shelley Moore Capito. Now, believe it or not, there's actually another son of a current West Virginia politician running for governor. Chris Miller is the son of current current U.S. Rep. Carol Miller. Then we have Patrick Morrissey, who's the current Attorney General, and Mac Warner, who's the current Secretary of State. There's probably a lot more endorsements than are listed here, but Moore Capito did secure the endorsement of Governor Jim Justice. That could be a valuable endorsement. He also does, of course, have the endorsement of his own mother. And as far as I can tell, I did not find a Donald Trump endorsement in this race. But what about the polling? Well, this is all over the place. Patrick Morrissey has generally been the leader, but he's only in the low to mid-30s. Moore Capito is right behind him, Chris Miller is also over 20%, and even Mac Warner is pulling into double digits. So there could be some fireworks here in this Republican primary. It's a super red state. It's probably not possible for any of these candidates to be too cozy with Trump, but whoever wins that primary is going to have to face a Democrat, and it looks like they've got Steve Williams, current mayor of the city of Huntington, and it looks like he is unopposed. The general election, this should be an easy hold for the Republicans. And finally, in the U.S. House, there are two congressional districts. They're both going to be deep red. In the first district, Carol Miller, who we mentioned earlier. She does have a primary challenger, but the second district is an open seat, and there's again a handful of Republicans vying for this nomination. I would guess the likely favorite is going to be Riley Moore, who is the current West Virginia state treasurer. I would guess his name ID would put him over the top. There's also not really any polling, but that's a quick look at West Virginia as well as the two other states for the primary on May 14th. There's always going to be more happening than I can mention in the video. I try to keep it moving and hit the highlights, but I'm going to leave it there for now. So what do you expect? for this primary. There are a few races that do look extremely competitive. Let me know down below. Be sure to stop by for a potential live stream. On your way out, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Join if you'd like to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.